NFL logos I'd like to see for the 9-1-1 games. Never forget. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. I'd like to thank you again for allowing me to come into your homes and share my thoughts about baseball, football, basketball, and hockey, and on the college realm as well, and sometimes even high school. If you were in on the episode last week, you saw that me uh, do kind of a tribute to the Rutgers undefeated team of 1976 and how that was a catalyst for potentially all of the new conferences. And as I stated in a couple of programs past, the shifting of the powers in college continue. The Texas-Oklahoma earthquake in the Big 12 has now had that conference reach out to Cincinnati, Houston, and a couple of other schools, and BYU, as I'm just thinking of this right now, as they look to join the Big 12 and try to re-fortify that conference. And as anyone who has, again, seen that show about the SEC, I am actually predicting more shifts in conferences and new allegiances among the schools, and then potentially really down the road, I would say in the next five, six years, where we just have a pro minor league of college schools playing at an upper, upper level, being led, of course, by the growing SEC conference. However, this weekend, I will return to that as the college football season develops, and there were a number of upsets this weekend in college football. But I'd like to turn some matters. I'd like to go over a couple of things. This week, Howard uh, had sent me an email about Sam Cunningham. And I remember him as Sam the Bam Cunningham. And of course, he might be considered like a footnote player in the history of the New England Patriots. But the funny thing is about Sam Cunningham, if you're a real NFL and actually college football fan, you'll know that ironically, I I, I took what Howard was saying about Sam Cunningham. He, he he sent me an email. I don't know whether you saw this or not. He wasn't aware of this particular player because he knows I, he, I did because I follow college football like I do religiously. But I remember Sam Cunningham in the early 70s playing for SC, always hurt in Notre Dame in some way, shape, or form. But actually, the funny thing is Sam Cunningham did not realize this until I was doing some investigation that he was part of the first all-black uh, backfield in SC uh, Southern Cal uh, football history back in the early 70s. But that isn't uh, what I most remember him about. I do remember him playing for the Patriots, albeit not as a, at an all-star level, although he was pretty pretty good for what he did. We've got to remember he was a fullback. But he was part of a significant change in the way college football was evolving in the 70s, and that was this. And this actually was the subject of an ESPN show, and Alabama decided to play SC Southern Cal in Southern Cal uh, in the early 70s. Bear Bryant booked the game with John McKay, and the Crimson Tide, the team that dominates today, was totally obliterated by the speed, the power, the talent of the SC Trojans. And that's when Bear Bryant really, really realized that he had to really recruit, actively recruit African-American players to a conference that had been really, when you think about it, the last of all the conferences to integrate. Now, there had been some players in the SEC, like a guy who always stands out for me, Conridge Holloway, who was a quarterback for, for Tennessee. I believe that... Um, Obviously, Alabama actually goes out and starts to recruit black players. And with the influx, the integration of African-Americans into the Southeast Conference, I mean, uh, let's face it, the South is all about football. It's the biggest hotbed for football, maybe outside of California and to a certain extent, maybe uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. But we can see what the SEC has done particularly a number of schools like Georgia, Alabama, uh, what they, how they have changed the landscape. And I'm telling you right now, Southern uh, Southeast Conference football was a bore to watch when I was a kid. 
Yes, it was usually just Alabama, sometimes Tennessee, sometimes Georgia. But all they did was run the football, and it was boring football. Now, I'm not saying running the football today isn't fun, but they had to catch up to, let's say, the Notre Dames and the Pac-10, or actually it was the Pac-8 then, uh, throwing the ball. They were, when you think about it, probably the last of the uh, overall conferences to really everyone embracing throwing the football. Cunningham and the SC Trojans had something to do with it because it was an epiphany for Bear Bryant and the rest of the Southeast Conference that they were missing out on something. And coaches being what they are, they don't care what color you are. All they care about are the W's. And I mean that in, you know, they want to win and they don't care who's on their roster. And for Bear Bryant, it was an epiphany. And him really being the leader of the whole thing, the SEC became more and more integrated. And whereas today, it is by far the conference of them all in college football. Sam Cunningham passed away this week or this past week. Just, uh, I didn't realize this. It's kind of, um, you know, football is a kind of wild sport. Oh, here he is in that game. And this was the subject of an, uh, of an ESPN story. I also think it was a book. There was a book written about this particular game. It was a Saturday night. I do think that ABC uh, did televise the game, but the score was closer than real uh, than really what happened or transpired on the football field. Sam Cunningham was part of that, and uh, you know, for years, if you are a Notre Dame fan like I am. Southern Cal was a thorn in your side, and they always found a new hero every time to just destroy the Irish. <laughs> in fact, I do recall this from the time I started following Notre Dame football when, in 1969, up until Lou Holtz came in. The only time that Notre Dame beat Southern Cal were in the years that they won the national title. So you're talking about 66 73 and 77, it really got to be frustrating. Holtz comes in and actually dominates SC. I think he had uh, one tie in the 10 years that he was uh, played against Southern Cal. I think they tied one game or one loss. But uh, even in his first couple of years, in fact, I'll tell you this, here's a story. Uh, basically, Tim Brown won his Heisman Trophy beating SC or the beginnings of it because he had a huge run back against them in a game out in uh, the Coliseum. And that was the catalyst for a lot of votes for the next year, Tim Brown winning the 87 Heisman Trophy. But that particular game, I can remember CBS pulled a Heidi Bowl game and that was, or a Heidi game. They actually uh, cut away from the game as John Carney, I believe, was launching a kick to win a game that Notre Dame rallied from double digits behind to tie SE, get the ball, and then score in the waning seconds of the ball game out in the Coliseum. And they cut away to show something else on TV on a Saturday afternoon. And it was obviously Thanksgiving Day weekend because when Notre Dame plays SE, they go out there on uh, Thanksgiving. When Notre Dame plays uh, Southern Cal at home, it's usually first or second week in October. It's just part of the whole tradition with college football. It's amazing. But that was Sam Cunningham. A, he was an All-American. Good player. He is related to Randall Cunningham. They are brothers. Didn't realize this, that Randall Cunningham had uh, a son or uh, that's the nephew of Sam Cunningham. Randall was a pretty good player, too. Um but he bounced around. Cunningham, Sam Cunningham, played exclusively for the Patriots and actually made their Hall of Fame. Uh, averaged 3.9 yards per carry in his pro career. But I think it paled in comparison to what he did with SC. Uh, there are just some players that are just, you just always remember them more as the college player than as the pro. And there are some pros that just really just come out of nowhere. And I'm thinking of like Johnny Unitas who played at Louisville. Really, nobody 
in a lot of ways hurt of him. And then, of course, he is arguably the greatest uh, quarterback the NFL has ever seen. That's for another day. I'm just saying arguably. All right. Speaking of Notre Dame, we lost another college football uh, figure. And maybe you can even say fixture. And that was this week, Terry Brennan, who coached the Irish uh, during the 1950s, actually from 1954 to 1958. He was 32 and 18 in his career with the Irish. He started off pretty well, uh, 9-1 and one and 8-2. and two, And basically, the wheels fell off the wagon. Went 2-8, and 7-3, and 6-4 and four before he was let go. The interesting thing is, I was reading uh, about him. He actually wrote a book about his career, and the book was aptly titled, or oddly titled, Through the Odds Be Great or S Small, is a uh, is the full self-telling of Coach Brennan's personal stories. He pulled Notre Dame football back from the brink of disaster. Now, i got to be honest here. I don't know what disaster he might be talking about. I never... and. Listen, I've been following Notre Dame football for quite a bit. I don't remember them having an academic problem with the players. Uh, he actually followed the great Frank Leahy. So when he followed Leahy, here's what Notre, here's what he was actually following. Frank Leahy, uh, in his second stint at Notre Dame, or in his second set, because he was, uh, well, you DeVore, uh, replace him for one year. I think Leahy might have been sick. I'm not sure, or stepped down. But he comes back in 1945. They go 7-2-1, 8-0-1, 9-0, 9-0-1, 10-0, 4-4-1, 7-2-1, 7-2-1, 9-0-1. He won nine national championships a couple of times there, at least four or five times that I, I'm, I'm just looking at sports reference. And then Terry Brennan succeeds him. And probably off the players that Leahy had recruited, he goes nine and one. So I don't know where the brink of disaster for Notre Dame football was that Terry Brennan is talking about. I would love to, uh, and to be fair, I'd, I'd like to read the book and see what was going on. But the reason I love this picture, now, if you are an old movie buff like I am, if you have that thrill of nostalgia for football, isn't this the uh, the picture of what college coaches, even high school coaches, even pro football coaches look like back in the day with the lanyard, with the whistle, the hat, and the sweatshirt. Very rarely do we see these guys dressed like this today. Um, this is how I remember, even if you if you see stories of uh, of Lombardi, Vince Lombardi. He's in like the cleats on the sideline with the sweatpants and this type of shirt with the baseball hat and the uh, and the lanyard during practice. Of course, he dressed in a suit and tie for the football games and occasionally even wore the fedora. Man, there are some days, you know, here's what throwback football they should do or retro football or, you know, when when football has the old jerseys and stuff, they should actually make the coaches dress like they used to be in the 50s and 60s. Either they can come out in a sweatsuit like Terry Brennan or wear a coat and tie and no, mi no microphones and no headphones. And just have, let's say, um, their game plan wrapped up like uh, in, in, a, in a role, okay, like Hank Stram used to do. Anyway. Uh, Terry Brennan, pretty good coach. He was succeeded by Joe Koharczyk, who really had a tough time. Then Hugh DeVore comes back. Hugh DeVore had two seasons as the Irish coach. He was 7-2-1, and one, and then he comes back right before Era takes over, and he's 2-7. and seven. Era takes basically the same team that went 2-7 and seven for uh, the Irish, or DeVore in 1963, goes 9-1, and 7-2-1. and 9-0-1. Oh, That's 1966. That one is the tie against Michigan State. But basically in three years, ARA brings the Irish back to national champion status. Uh, and as I said, that was one year that he beat USC. The following year, 8-2. and two. Guess who he lose to? 
The following year, seven and two. Guess who he loses to? Eight and two. Guess who he loses? Ten and one in 1970. Guess who he loses to? And that was a killer because uh, that 1970 game, I believe, was played out in uh, SC. I believe that was played out there because Notre Dame would just always win. Yep, they played SC out in the Coliseum and lost them 28, uh, 38, 28. The reason I say it was a killer is that they beat Texas, which had been unbeaten in the Cotton Bowl. It avenges the loss that they had the year before when they finished 10, one and one or 10, two and one. And they beat Texas and going into that uh, New Year's night, there was a possibility that the Irish might've been the number one team had LSU beaten Nebraska. They didn't. So, because they lost to SC, Ara lost a potential third national championship. Because you remember, he wins in 73 and, and retires, or he wins the 73 uh, national title, steps down after the 74 season. And uh, so he could have had 66, uh, 70, and the 73 seasons as national titles. That would have really put him in the upper echelon of uh, coaches of all time. That being said, SC, of course, the Sam Cunninghams, all right, go on to play for the Patriots, are, of course, the thorn in the Irish side. I, I got to be honest with you, never thought I would take the show this way because I do want to talk a little bit about the Yankees and really their free fall. And I think I know why it is. I was talking to my buddy and I told him, hey, I, I just want you to know who I'm rooting for because I such I have always hated the Yankees since the time I was a, a, a kid. And I said, you know who I'm rooting for? And he said to me, no, who? I said, the Yankees. <laughs> and, and he actually said to me, now watch, they're just going to go to the bottom. Well, sure enough, look at what the Yankees, what has happened to the Yankees. After winning all those games in a row, I think 13 straight or 14 straight, they bottomed out. Yes, I know that they beat the Mets last night in a tribute to the 9-11 game, but they have really bottomed out. And the Yankees, I, ju I just want to kind of I, – I, I'm not going to say they're not winning or losing this year. Do they have a chance to make the playoffs? Yeah, probably. It's one thing to make the playoffs. Do they have a chance – to win the whole thing or win the pennant? Maybe they have a chance to win the pennant. Do they have a chance to win the World Series? I don't know. And I'm just doing the science on all this. I was looking at only, and of course, I was doing a quick research on the Yankees. Now, they've won 27 World Series. I can't believe they haven't won one since 2009. This is the third longest drought in their history. This is going back uh, 2000. This is 2021, so you're talking about 13 seasons or 12 seasons with this being the 13th if they don't win. And that would be the third longest in their history of uh, a, a drought between World Series wins. Put it this way, with the arrival of Ruth and, and basically winning the first their, their first World Series in 1923 with Ruth in the lineup, the Yankees really dominated the 30s and the 40s and even through the 50s. When they got to the 60s, that's, you know, their last World Series was 1962. They had to go to all the way to 1977, which was a long drought. I have it as 15 years. All right. And then they win 77, 78. And then, wow, you can't believe the drought from 78 to, to 1996. The Yankees are nowhere. That's a huge drought. Like, I'm even thinking, you just can't, you know, being an anti-Yankee and now living through the 70s and the 80s and the, and the 90s, you just can't believe how long a drought that is for that franchise. And I was making the argument, or is this Yankee team slowly becoming those 90s teams, which are just big, slow uh, home run hitting type of players who can only play, let's say, three different positions at most, DH, 
first base and the corner outfield spots and probably more left than right because they really don't have the arm. And I got to be honest with you, and I'm trying to be fair with the Yankees and the Yankee fans, but take a look at this. The Yankees right now have nobody who is going to have or top 100 RBIs. And that's a subject I'm working on for another show. It's been frustrating to watch baseball lately because it has, and I, I've said this before on the uh, shows, it's really become like wiffle ball in your backyard. Strikeout, walk, home run. Everything else doesn't mean anything. And I was thinking one day when I was, and this is with Aaron Judge. Now, he's got 32 home runs. But he's not even going to have 100 RBIs. He's going to come close, like 98 or 99, if he plays the rest of the 20 games. But when I was a kid, and this is where I'm going with this when I do the, uh, the study on a future show. Basically, it's this. Earl Weaver used to say, I always look for the three-run home run. So I always thought about that, and I said, yeah, I think that's a pretty good ratio, that your home run hitter has a home run for every three RBIs he drives in. Significant, right? So I was actually looking at the home run guys, and this is where I'm, I'm going with this, but I'd like to make it a little bit more simplified. Do you realize the home run guys, just take a look at the number of home runs being hit and how few RBIs are coming off the result of the home run. I mean, we have guys that have like 27 home runs and 50 RBIs. If you took... Weaver's ratio of one for three, you know, three run home run. This guy's hitting 27 home runs, should have 81 RBIs. 30 and 90, 33 and 99, 34 and 102. We have guys right now, um, we had home run hitters, and of course, I'm, I'm going to give you that more later. Uh, over 40 home runs, and that doesn't even equate to 100 RBIs. Now, you can say to me, well, what does that mean? It means is this. Everybody's looking to hit the home runs. Nobody's looking to get on base, no matter what all of the metrics is telling you about with the love for the walk and the on-base percentage. Nobody, and in particular, I've watched a number of Yankee games in the last two, two weeks. It seems to me, from my perspective, that none of the Yankees have any clue how to get on base other than hitting a home run or maybe getting an occasional walk. And it's hurting the game. How do I know that? Well, put it this way. For Yankee championships, do you realize I'm just going through this. Only six times in the 27 World Series wins that the Yankees have had championships have they had no player, no hitter, have 100 RBIs on their ball club. Now, I can even say this. Interestingly enough, from 1958 all the way back to the 30s is when you have the most, and that is one, two, three, four, five guys or five Yankee World Championship teams from the 1950s all the way back to the 30s and the 20s that did not have a player drive in 100 runs. Now, that comes with this stipulation. They're only playing 154 games there. Those eight games do matter. So guys maybe who had maybe 96 or 97 RBIs, maybe with the extra eight games, maybe the home run with the three RBIs, now you're getting 100 RBIs. Now, I can pull any kind of stats out. These are just fun little stats. This Yankee team, though, has nobody driving in 100 RBIs. Now, the likelihood that they win the World Series, and I think it is significant because I think an RBI man that has now become overlooked with the metrics, I think sometimes the metrics guys look at it and say RBIs. And uh, RBIs have were what we always thought of as run scored when we were a kid, that ah, the run scores were just a result of not you doing anything to set yourself up to score as much as the guy behind you driving you in. And RBIs as a kid were bigger than run scored. But now it's almost like the tide has turned, changed, and there are metrics showing how guys can
get themselves in run scoring positions. And I think that is important. Let's face it. As Joe Morgan used to say, it was a great feeling to go 0 for 4 and somehow some way score three runs. And that was setting yourself up. And it's, you know, I don't have the exact quote. I'm paraphrasing. It, but it was almost like this. You get on by a force play. You steal a base. You move over on a sack fly. And you score maybe on a Baltimore chopper or a fielding play. That's a run. You've manufactured that. Your speed, your baseball smarts, your acumen for the game has helped produce or manufacture that run. And RBI guys seem to be off on the side now. But RBI guys are important. And in fact, uh, along with the number of uh, a few RBI guys, like for instance, I, I think what actually you can say this, I was looking at the runs scored and the runs against by the Yankees in their championship years, World Series, not their pennant. They were above the league average in 26 of the 27 years in both categories. The one year that they weren't was 1996. They were just uh, a few points under the league average for runs scored. And of course, what's interesting about that 96 team, you could probably consider that of that run, probably the least talented of all the Yankee teams during that run. And yet that team somehow, some way managed, cobbled together enough runs. I'm not saying they led the league in runs, but they did enough to win the games and win the championship and the World Series. But then that started the whole uh, uh, Yankee dynasty with the core four and Derek Jeter and Mariano and all the rest of it. Now, the Yankees don't win without Mariano, and that brings me up to this point. The Yankees right now, and I went back all the way to 1923 with the saves, and I'm going to discard the saves with the Yankees up until about 1969. The reason being is that the save, even though it is in baseball reference, and I'm sure that they, uh, they've done due diligence uh, to go back to the box scores and probably uh, go over every box score and then give saves uh, to the pitchers or uh, give them the benefit of, of the saves. You know, it was back in 69, 70 that the save became a stat. Uh, of uh, that we we talk about today, the Yankees right now, they're on uh, they're on a path to only have forty nine saves. The problem is they've had only three teams since nineteen sixty nine that have had under forty saves as a team to win the World Series. Most of the time, it was above 45, 50, 45, 50, 50. And um, the save in itself, maybe not that important, but 49 saves, you wonder, uh, they're on that path, I don't know, right now. As we go, 43 today. You wonder if the bullpen, and this is why I'm saying all this, is the bullpen strong enough? to weather the number of playoff stages that we have. And it's much harder in a way to get to the World Series today and then get into the World Series. They're starting pitchers. It is right now, their starting pitchers have only given them 37 wins. And this includes Corey Kluber, who's you know right now out. They're on a path for 42 wins. That would be their lowest from a starting staff. Ever. The lowest in the last, let's say, from 1960 on to today, the lowest from the, the starting pitching staff, 54 wins. And that was when they had four guys, 54 wins from the 62 staff. That would be a concern. What does this indicate? Well, indicates maybe nothing, or it also indicates something that the Yankees have really struggled with all year and that their starting pitching isn't going deep enough to merit getting either a, a, a decision. 
the number of losses that they have right now, they have 29 losses. They are on target for 33. Now, what might be unfair for me to say is this, that the losses are racked up because more and more starting pitchers uh, went the distance way back when. But let's just consider from 1962. That 33 is higher than the 29 they suffered in 62. And it's higher from the 2019. And they, and that's right now. Actually, they're on, uh, yeah, they're on a path for 33 losses. So uh, I, I look at it this way. It's not so much the losses and maybe not so much the wins, but take a look at the difference between wins and losses. That's only a plus nine. The Yankees in 2000 were a plus four from their starting staff. So that should be an issue. Probably the greatest uh, staff that they had, the 1932, the starting staff. Now I'm talking about the four prominent pitchers were 91 and 37 for the 1932 team. That team also had four guys drive in at least 100 RBIs. That team also, uh, even though they didn't lead or they were tied for the league league, ready for this? 6.4 runs per game, and they only allowed 4.6 runs per game. Uh, they were tied with Washington for uh, probably the fewest runs allowed per game. And they were tied with the Philadelphia A's, who were in a dynasty back in the 30s as well, uh, with the most runs scored per game. And like I said, they had 91 and 37 for their starting staff. Amazing. Just because uh, uh, unbelievable. And, you know, that might not even be as high as the 1939 team, which was 80 and 33, their starting staff. And I was looking at this. Ready for this? The Yankees, with the exception of, as I said, their runs for and runs against, were above uh, league averages in both. Above for the runs scored in 26 of 27 World Series wins. I said, like I said, the 96 uh, offense was a little bit below, not that much. And all of their pitching in their championship seasons, World Series titles, all 27 are way below. You know, it's interesting with the Yankees as I'm, I'm speaking and looking at this. I know they're known as the Bronx Bombers, the Murders Row. They are known of Ruth and Gurig and Mantle and DiMaggio and Barra. But really, the Yankees had some really good pitching as well. And we brought that up with Vic Rasky. We've talked about Whitey Ford. Even Mel Stottlemyre, even though he didn't, you know, play on any Yankee championship teams per se. These are good pitchers that the Yankees, and they're often overlooked, unfortunately. But the Yankees, when I, I was looking at this, ready for this? You know how many times the Yankees led in the 27 championships that they won? They, won, they led the league in runs scored 17 times. They led the league in runs prevention, runs against. And I'm not saying ERA necessarily, but it does indicate a good pitching staff. How many times did the Yankees have the number one runs against in fewest runs? 19 times. 19 times. And even that 96 team, when I think about it, their pitching was more solid, you would argue, than their, uh, than their offense. Even those days of the 77, 78 Yankees, 76, it was really, they had better pitching. I always say this, that um, if you had probably the 77 and 78 Yankee pitching staff, well, you could say it about anything. But really, when I think about it, the 76 Reds, yes, without a doubt, a dynamite team, a team for the ages but they certainly didn't really have the pitching that the Yankees would have in their uh, consecutive World Series of 77 and 78, like the Reds of 75 and 76. I really don't think they compare. In fact, you have a Hall of Famer in Catfish Hunter on, on both those teams, 77 and 78, even though he, yes, 
it was over the hill and all the rest of it. But um, these Yankee teams, here's what the Yankees are right now. The Yankees, this would be, all right, getting back, and, and this is all about the Yankees right now. They have 43 saves. They're starting pitching. 37 and 29, which projects to 42 and 33. Right now, they don't have a player, and it projects to the 162 games that they would not have a player drive in 100 runs. And for Yankee teams, you got to go back to 1978 for a World Series Yankee team to have no player on their roster without 100 RBIs. The Yankees. With their runs scored, they're averaging 4.32. And they're allowing 4.12 runs per game. Now, the 4.12, that's not too bad measured against the Yankee teams of old. But the 4.32 runs per game is a concern. Considering this, 12 years ago when the Yankees won 2009 World Series, they scored 5.65 runs per game. The 1998 team scored 5.96 runs per game. Ready for this? And I'm not even going to get to, to the Ruth and all the rest of it. Put it this way. From 1939, the 1938, the 1937, and the 1936, and the 1932 Yankee World Champion teams averaged – well, these were their numbers, 32, 6.4, 6.9, 6.2, 6.2, 6.4. By the way, they led the league in runs scored by a good chunk, by a good margin. Interestingly enough, they also led the league in runs prevented per game, 37, 4.5, 4.3, 4.7, and 4.6. They were awesome teams. This Yankee team, this at 4.32, if they happen to somehow manage the World Series, it would be the lowest runs uh, for. It would be the, the lowest run scored per game by a world championship Yankee team since the 1943 team won the World Series, averaging 4.3 runs per game. And here's the problem with that. That 43 team, we were in the midst of World War II. So all their best, you know, many of the best athletes were serving. And this Yankee team, which managed 4.3, but that runs prevented was at 3.5. This is so close. This is also uh, another concern if you're a Yankee fan. 4.32 runs per game you're scoring as a Yankee team. You're allowing 4.12. That's a 0.20. Difference, 0.2 difference. That's like the smallest margin of potentially, if they win the World Series, of any Yankee champion. That's a huge concern. Consider this. The Yankees 2009, they were a full run better. Run scored, runs prevented. The Yankees of 98, were nearly two runs better, 5.96 to 4.05. And in their heyday, ready for this, like I said, the 1939 team, 6.4 runs scored per game, 3.7 for the opposition. The Yankees during Ruth, the 1927 team, you know, is usually seen as the greatest uh, Yankee team anyway, put together of all time and arguably the greatest Yankee team. Uh, or baseball team ever assembled. They scored 6.3 runs per game, allowed only 3.9. Guys, they were winning games by two runs every game on average. That's incredible. This Yankee team is winning by 0.2. This Yankee team, and I'm probably going to be wrong when I say it's really not that good. And they really do have a problem getting on base They really do have a problem, and this is nothing new if you've been following the Yankees all year. They have a real problem just creating a a rally 
And I have maintained, I've started to maintain this. I think your best hitter is no longer your home run hitter. He doesn't necessarily have to be the guy who gets on base, but it's the guy who most consistently can start a rally. To me, they are your best players. In fact, when I used to keep all kinds of stats for all my various weekend warrior softball teams, there were guys I used to track and say, you know, maybe he doesn't hit for high average or maybe he doesn't always get three hits in a game. Maybe it's just one. But I always noticed with this one particular player, he seems to always be in the middle of rallies, either starting one or keeping one going. And right now, the Yankees do not have that player. And how do I know that? I'm looking at the numbers. When your big home run hitters are not driving in uh, runs at, let's say, the Earl Weaver ratio of one to three, and when you have the smallest differential between runs scored and runs prevented of any potential Yankee World Series team or a champion, you have problems. So going forward, Yankees, lowest wins from their starting staff in their history if they win a World Series. It's going to be tough for the Yankees. Do I think they'll make the playoffs? Probably. Do I think they can win the pennant? Maybe. Do I think they can win the World Series? Based on the numbers and the science, it's going to be a miracle. This is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History. Thanking you again for allowing me into your homes and talking all things sports. See you next week.